The first thing I want to do is I want to thank you for being a part of Crossroads Christian Church. This church would not be what it is today if it were not for you. And I thank God regularly uh, for all the families that make up this church. And I just wanted to start things off by just thanking you for being a part of the church. Above and beyond, uh, we chose these words for this uh, because it has everything to do with perspective and, and, and the big picture and the way that we approach life. And we want to encourage you know, each and every person in this church to be a part of this because it will help position each and every one of us and all of us as a church body to be more fruitful for the cause of Christ. Does it involve finances? Well, obviously it does. But that's not the sum total of what this campaign's all about. That's more or less the tip of the iceberg. Stewardship is, is not just financial. It is financial, it certainly is that, but it also includes stewardship of your time. Every one of us has 168 hours to work with uh, in any given week. Stewardship of our abilities, the talents that we have, and it's also stewardship of opportunities that come our way as well. To me, stewardship means that I am responsible for the resources that God has given to me in this life. And so whether it's um, financial or, or my time or my talents, then it's my responsibility and in fact my pleasure to, to give back to the Lord and do with, with those things what it is that He wants me to do. Well, I've always broken down stewardship in my mind three ways, time, treasure, and talent. And uh, as far as treasure, we, we've been lucky. Uh, we've had great careers, and, and but we've been challenged before by God to give money that we didn't think we should be giving after prayer life. And uh, the jury's in, come talk to me. It works every time beyond your wildest dreams. If he tells you to do it, do it. He has great plans for you. If it's you and him, he'll answer your prayers and give the money. More, more focus for me has been of my time and of my talent. And I get really frustrated with myself when I feel like I'm cheating in that area. So for me, the stewardship is, is giving God first place in your, your heart, your time, your um, relationships, your possessions. And one of the things I learned just this past um, semester in one of the Bible studies is that the more we empty ourselves, the more God can fill us up. And there's nothing better than that. That's really what in this, in this above and beyond emphasis, we're talking about let's take the next step in becoming more fully devoted uh, with a deeper commitment and a greater love for the cause of Christ in all of these different areas. You know, we, we, we have certain images in our mind that, that being a follower of Christ means that, you know, you go to church most Sundays and you own a Bible and maybe you're a part of a small group or you say prayers before a meal or something like that and that's kind of the cultural that's the cultural picture of what we have of of what a christian looks like but uh, the challenge we're getting here is let's set aside that and let's look at how does god define a disciple let's pray let's seriously pray that god will stir within us that he will prompt us and that we will have both the boldness and the courage to take him up on it and to take that step take that step of faith yeah it's time it's time for us to step out of the boat i want to i want to start off by sharing where one of the words that I just used in the video, um, where the inspiration for that word comes from. And uh, so I'm going to read a couple of verses in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15. And this is a very familiar passage of Scripture. It is uh, the one uh, that's entitled, The Vine and the Branches. How Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And how, how we can't exist and we can't survive and certainly cannot thrive you know, unless, unless we're connected uh, to the vine. And, uh, but I want you to notice the way the passage opens up. The first two verses says this. Of course, this is Jesus talking. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. 
and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. And, and that's the key here. I use the word fruitful, you know, that, that God wants us to be fruitful. And, you know, if you're wondering, okay, well, where does it say that in the Bible? It says it right here. I mean, and if you got a red letter edition of the Bible, this is red letter. These are the words of Jesus. That this, this is part of what God's design is, part of what, what God intends and wills to do in your life and in my life as well is, is to uh, enable us to, to, on his part, prune us so that we are even more fruitful than what we have been in the past. Now, it's possible that a person can kind of approach this whole subject and say, now, wait a minute, I'm, I mean, I'm already giving. I'm already serving. I mean, I'm already doing some things for God. And, and the response to that would be, absolutely, thumbs up. That's great. God wants you to be even more fruitful. You see, the Christian life is all about a process. It's, it's where we, we are progressing and becoming more and more fruitful. We're becoming more and more of what God would have us to be and to be doing what God would have us to do. And, 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 and that's a process. You know, the whole thing about growing in Christ and, and maturing and changing and becoming more of what he wants us to be, that is a process. And whether you're talking about in a spiritual a, a, a spiritual way for an individual Christian, or you're talking about for an entire church, or you're even talking about in a physical way as an individual. Um, it's not something that, that happens on this real gradual, you know, it's just, you know, as you grow, as you mature, it's just, it's an even uh, change year by year, month by month, as you, as you progress in your life. That's not the way growth takes place. Growth takes place more, uh, to use a word for it, more in a sporadic sort of a way. When I was growing up, um, I never really paid attention to how tall I was and stuff like that until I got in fifth grade, and then all of a sudden that became a big deal. Primarily it was because of a kid named Rick that moved to our school. Rick Cheeks was his name, and uh, he was five foot seven. I had been the tallest kid in the class, five foot five. And, and I didn't know how tall I was. I just knew he was taller than me. And he kept bragging about how tall he was. So I went home and I measured myself. I wanted to find out how tall am I. And I was like two inches below. You know, and, and it was just like, oh, I, I need to grow. I, I, want to get, I want to get taller than Rick. And, uh, and I wanted to get taller than my dad. My dad was like three inches taller than me uh, when, when I was in, in sixth grade. And, and, uh, and sure enough, it happened. Between sixth grade to seventh grade and seventh grade to eighth grade. Mid-year, in that two, you know, measuring it from the middle of, of sixth grade to the middle of eighth grade, I grew 10 inches. You know, that was the growing spurt in my life. You know, and so for some of my relatives that didn't see me there for a couple years, all of a sudden, you know, I looked very different and, uh, and very much taller than Rick. He stayed at 5'7". And uh, so I accomplished that. But, but you know, that's, that's the way that progressing as far as growth, that's, that's the way it works physically. And, and if you had ever kept track of things like that, like on the back of a door or a door frame of the house as a kid growing up, you know, you notice that, that it works that way. The same thing happens spiritually in an individual's life. You don't grow at, at an even rate the entire time. There are things that uh, serve as catalysts that, that, causes, that cause spurts of growth. And, and I look back in my life during the time where I went through some of the most adversity with cancer and stuff like that, and uh, by far, I look at that as being the time when I grew more spiritually than at any other time in my life. And adversity has a way of doing that. You know, we hate adversity, but yet that is part of the fruit that comes out of adversity is that if we're cooperating with God, you know, we'll, we'll grow. Now, there's other things, too, including what we're doing right here. You know, with this whole Above and Beyond can, campaign, this, this too can serve as a catalyst that can help us individually, personally to grow. The same thing is true on a church level. If you look at, you know, the 17 and a half years that Crossroads has been around, and you look at our attendance figures, for example, um, you're not going to see a real steady, you know, even, you know, growth, incline taking place over all this time. Instead, you're going to see bump, you know, you bump, you know, I mean, every, every now and then it, it happens in, in surges. And, and, and basically, I say all that to say this. That's what we want this campaign to be. We want this campaign 
to be a tool in God's hands, that, that he finds us willingly making ourselves available for him to do a good work in our life, pruning us as individuals, pruning us as a church to grow and to be more productive, more fruitful than we ever have been before. You know, so, so there, there's, there's the biblical passage that talks about this being God's intent and all. And, and, and we're going to talk about stuff like expanding the parking lot out here as, as a result of Above and Beyond campaign. You know, we're going to be expanding the parking lot. We're going to be putting a monument sign out that, that faces Johnson Drive. We're going to be, um, over the next three years, paying down our mortgage. And, 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 and so there's certain things like that that are going to be happening as a result of this campaign. But ultimately, our vision as a church goes way beyond any of that. And so if we look at all of this and we just think that's the goal, then we've missed the point. Our goal, our vision as a church goes way beyond that. You know, we've said it many times and you've read it. Uh, many times in the bulletin and newsletters and, and in various other places as well. The purpose of this church is this. We exist to bring people to Jesus Christ and to assist them in becoming his fully devoted, reproducing followers. You know, ultimately, that is our goal. That is why Crossroads was started, you know, back in the mid-90s, and that continues to be our guiding light, that continues to be the goal that, that we're striving for and, and, and what it is that we are trying to accomplish. Quite frankly, there is not any of us in this room that need a big monument sign out here on the property. Because you know where the church is, the building, right? I mean, you got here tonight without that sign out there. And you get there on Sunday, get here on Sunday without that. You and I, we don't need that sign. But the thing is, we're not creating a sign for you or for me. That does not have anything to do with us. We don't need more parking places. Quite frankly, we could do just fine to continue on with what we have right now. And we've been doing it. Yeah, sometimes it gets a little tight, you know, a little dicey out there in the parking lot, you know, once in a while. But, uh, uh, but you know, it's, it's sufficient for us. But that's the thing. We're not looking at expanding the parking lot for us. That's not why we're, we're increasing the number of parking places. As far as the mortgage goes and, and, and more quickly, you know, reducing the amount of our mortgage, we're not doing that for us. Because, quite frankly, we're doing fine making our payments. We have, as of yet, to ever be late for a payment. We're, the bank loves us. I mean, because we're making our payments on time. They never have to, oh, now they're two months behind, you know, and what are we going to do to put pressure on? The bank has never had to do that with us. They love us. In fact, at one time, we had a bank that was regularly bringing chocolate chip cookies to the office. We really liked that bank. Um, but, uh, I mean, that, that was just how grateful they were. And, and, and so the whole idea of reducing, reducing the debt for us, well, yeah. why do we need that? We're doing okay. The income that's coming in and, and paying utility bills, paying for ministry that's going on and, and, and reducing the debt. You know, for us, we don't see that as a felt need in our life, but that's just it. We're not doing that for us. You see? I mean, there's a bigger picture here, and that's the point. As far as what we, what we represent as a church and what we're trying to accomplish as a church. That's why we have been emphasizing prayer so much in this campaign. You have been hearing us talk about prayer, creating uh, creative opportunities for prayer, and, and it's because there's, there's a spiritual dimension to all this that needs to be in place for this campaign to be successful. And that's why for some in this room, maybe you've, uh, you've already got one of these, you're carrying around a little rock in your pocket, and it serves as a reminder. And I'm the type of person that I regularly and dozens of times throughout a day, I put my hands in my pocket. It's just a normal thing. And once I get my hand past my pocket knife, you know, then I'll feel a couple coins and I'll feel a rock. And as soon as I feel that rock, it's a reminder to pray 
God, do a good work in me through this above and beyond campaign. Stir within me. Speak to me. Do a good work in this church. Help prepare people's hearts that you might be glorified and your kingdom might be advanced. See, it's a reminder. Now, now whether it's a rock or we got bracelets that are over here, I mean, and, and you know, feel free to, if you don't, haven't ha already gotten one of those, feel free to get one of those and, and let that be a regular reminder to be praying. But we've been doing other things as well as prayer um, is concerned. Uh, the basement here in October, every Sunday morning, a couple opportunities every Sunday morning for people to go down in the basement. And I think there was 40, 40 people or something or other that were down there this last Sunday, you know, that were praying about the services and that people would be open and receptive and, and, and to hearing God's word. And, and so that's something that's going on. Uh, was it, wasn't it last Wednesday night? You know, we kind of had a creative uh, a prayer opportunity, had a great turnout for that. A lot of enthusiasm. Uh, involved with that. But again, it was all about prayer. Um, we're sending out these uh, little prayer uh, devotional things, email-wise. Um, and if, if you don't have internet or don't get emails, then, then we have hard copy forms of those. We've got another prayer event coming up here in about three weeks. And, and the point is just this. We have been really encouraging people to be in prayer because the success of this campaign, the success of God pruning us in a way that, that needs to happen comes down to where our heart is and how open and receptive our heart is. And, and I know of no better way for us to prepare our hearts for God to do a good work in our life than through prayer. You know, and so that's why we keep emphasizing prayer so much. And, and uh, certainly, you know, as a result of some of the information you're going to be getting here uh, tonight, you know, just bathe it in prayer between now and November 4th. Just make sure that you're making this a serious matter of prayer. Now, in order for God to prune us, we need to make sure we are tuned in to God. You know, I kind of like to think of it this way in regards to prayer. It's, it's, it's kind of like the old AM radios. And you'll remember that sometimes when you were trying to listen to it, whether it was a ball game or just some program that was on the radio, and, and, and you're turning that tuning dial, and sometimes it's kind of hard. You don't get it right away. I mean, it's not the push-button thing. I'm talking about the tuning dial. And, and, and you keep tuning it, and, tuning, and eventually you find the sweet spot. And as soon as you find that sweet spot, you know, it's like, carefully back away and sometimes you find out you got to stand right next to it for it to stay in that place but but you know as soon as you get that sweet spot you know it's like don't touch the radio I mean I've got it right now I can hear what's being said well see that's the sort of that's the sort of thing that we need to to be careful to be doing in regards to our prayers we're not talking about ritualistic prayers like just say your prayers at prayer time or at bedtime or you know go through your prayers that's not what we're talking about we're talking about communicating with God and when you're communicating with God it is important that you be tuning in to God because you need to hear what he might be ready to tell you one of the things that we have said and you're going to hear even more of in the next two Sunday mornings is that uh, uh, they're very likely for the vast majority of us, if not all of us, there is something God has been tapping you on the shoulder about for some time. And, and either you've been ignoring him, maybe you've been kind of scared about what it concerns, and so you just kind of ignore him, or maybe you're not even aware of it because you're not tuned in to that fact. We want to encourage you to get tuned in. There's a good story in the Bible that talks about the importance of this, and and, uh, and how it can happen. It's found in the book of 1 Kings, and it involves a fellow, a prophet by the name of Elijah. And you'll remember Elijah just came off of a mountaintop experience, and he was on cloud nine until the king's wife, Jezebel. There's a reason we don't name our little daughters Jezebel. <laughs> she put out a death warrant on Elijah, and everyone in the kingdom, including Elijah, knew she was not someone to be messed with. And, and man, he just freaked out, and he went into this depression, and he went to a real remote place and just went into hiding in a cave in the mountains. And, uh, and God conveyed to him that he was going to speak to him. 
And so Elijah knew God was getting ready to speak to him, and, and all of a sudden there was this strong wind that was blowing. And the, strong was so win the, the wind was so strong that it was dislodging rocks, and there was like an avalanche and stuff taking place. And so he walked to the entrance of the cave, fully expecting God is in this wind, because, man, this is a fierce wind. And so he got to the entrance, and he listened. Nothing. Wasn't anything there. So he went back. Not too much later, all of a sudden an earthquake took place. The ground started shaking. Everything started shaking. And he was thinking that, that the ceiling of the cave was going to collapse on him. And, and, but that wasn't the main reason he went to the entrance. He went to the entrance because he figured this has got to be God in the power of an earthquake. And so he went to the entrance to listen. And there was nothing. So he went back. And then sometime later, a fire broke out. Maybe not so unlike some of the fires that swept through Colorado and other parts of the country this year. A fire that was burning the entire mountainside. It was a fierce fire. And he was thinking in the middle of all of that, that that's God. And God's getting ready to say something. So he went to the entrance of the cave and nothing. Didn't hear anything. When he finally did hear God's voice, what form did it come in? You remember? A whisper. And, and there's a specific word in the Hebrew that is used. It wasn't just a whisper. The Hebrew word is dock. And that, that, in most of our English translations, is translated soft or gentle. But the word literally means thin. It was a very thin, small, tiny whisper. And Elijah went to the entrance of the cave and he really had to tune in and he could hear God speak that thin gentle whisper and what was it that God was telling Elijah get out of the boat well he wasn't in a boat so he didn't say that but he said get out of the cave that's what he told him and he gave him specific instructions of what he wanted him to be doing I mean, it, it goes kind of hand in glove with the very thing we're talking about here. But Elijah would have never heard any of that if he wasn't trying to tune in to hear what God had to say. So that's why, that's why we're emphasizing so much prayer. The success of this campaign, as has been the case with any other campaign that we have had since the church started, the success of it has everything to do with prayer. Things happen when people pray. And of that, the Bible is clear. All you got to do is go in the book of Acts. I'm reading through the Bible in a year like I normally do, and, and, and I'm, uh, I still got to read 1st, 2nd Peter. Otherwise, the only thing left is the book of Acts, and I'm halfway through Acts right now. And, and, and I've been reminded of that here these last two or three days. Things happen when people pray. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we have about 120 followers of Jesus after his death, burial, and resurrection, what were they spending their time doing? It tells us they were praying. They were praying diligently. In Acts chapter 2, after the birth of the church, in verse 42, what does it say the church was doing? They were devoted to prayer. I mean, that sets the tone for the entire book of Acts and, and the growth of the church. And then as we keep turning the pages in the book of Acts, we read about Peter and John uh, early on as they were going to the temple. And what were they going to the temple to do? To pray. And what happened? All of a sudden, an opportunity with a lame guy to, to uh, perform a miracle, and, and that led to another opportunity to talk to some of the Jewish authorities and, and to profess their faith in the risen Lord. And, and one thing after another created an opportunity for them. On another occasion, we have Peter. He's uh, staying at uh, Simon the Tanner's house, and he decides that uh, uh, he wants to spend some time in prayer, and he's trying to pursue a place. I don't know if Simon had little kids running around or what the deal was, but it tells us that what Peter did was he went up on the rooftop in order to find a place to pray. And so here he was going to, to the rooftop to pray, and what did that lead to? that led to someone just almost immediately knocking on the door, being set, sent by a fellow by the name of Cornelius, which led to Peter going and being a part of the first Gentile convert to Christianity. Most of us in here can be thankful that that happened. 
because we can be where we are in the faith now. We read a little bit further and we read about Paul and his companions and, and they were vi very busy as they were going from one town to another people, another town, evangelizing and, and just sharing the faith with people. And on this one particular day, they just, they just wanted to get away from everything and just spend time in prayer. And they thought, you know what? There's a good place on the riverbank. Let's go to the river. And let's just kind of get away from everything and spend time in prayer. They go down the river bank a ways. They run into a woman by the name of Lydia, and she is a seller of purple. Which purple in that time, in that culture, that, that was the, the type of clothing of royalty. It was very expensive. So she was a well-to-do person who had lots of connections. And so here, Paul and his companions not only had the opportunity to share the gospel with her and she was led to Christ, but then many of her connections she invited and they had the chance to share with them. Another occasion, we have Paul and Silas and they've been beaten and they're in, in shackles, in stocks, in the inner dungeon. And instead of moaning and complaining about their pain and the injustice of it all, they decide to spend time in prayer and praise. And that opened the door and created the opportunity of witnessing to the jailer, the chief jailer, led him to Christ, he and his whole family. You see, that's why I say that things happen when people pray. The very birth of this church, um, you, 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 may not, you may or may not know, uh, was bathed in prayer. Back when uh, Colette and I first uh, um, loaded up the rider truck when we were in Illinois and, and moved here in, in uh, August of 1994. Uh, we came and unloaded the truck in, in our house, and, and, and one, of, one of the first things I did, and I did it every two weeks. That was before the days of email. But every two weeks, I created a letter, a detailed letter, stating what the progress had been thus far in, in the prenatal stage of starting the church, because we were here about seven months before opening Sunday was going to take place, and, and uh, we needed people, and we, a lot of other things needed to happen. And, and so in this detailed letter that I would put together every two weeks, we would uh, mail a copy to Burnside, Illinois, the church that I had come from, and then we would also mail a letter to uh, Topeka, Kansas. And uh, which was the home church for both of us years earlier. And, and when they got these letters, they would copy them and distribute them to people in the church, and they were prayer letters. People in the church knew specifically what to pray for. Whenever I learned someone's name, they went in one of the letters. It was like, Lord, work on this person. They need to be a part of this church. And then I got people praying. You see, that, that, that was at the very foundation of the church before the church ever came into existence. It was being bathed in prayer. And so that's why, that's why it's very natural, it's good, it's the right thing for us to do, is that we need to be diligent in praying and praying with responsive hearts, that we have open and receptive hearts to God speaking to us and God leading us in the way that, uh, that he wants us to go and doing what he wants us to do so that we can be pruned and we can be even more fruitful as individuals and as a church family. So I want to get into some of the nuts and bolts regarding all this. So we've got some uh, uh, brochures that are going to be passed out at this time. So everyone gets one of these brochures, and while they are uh, getting these and starting to distribute them, let me just encourage you to be sure and, and take these home. We're not going to read through it all here during the time that we have. I will make reference to a number of pages and things that are, that are found on some of these pages, but uh, we're not going to be real thorough with it during our time that we're here. So please take this home and read over it all, uh, everything that's in it, and uh, include it as a matter of your prayer. But this gives... This provides some of the nuts and bolts uh, behind Above and Beyond, especially as it pertains to the financial side of things, especially in regards to that. So let me just start with telling you uh, a few of the basic components on this. First of all, when it comes to the financial side of this, uh, we, are, we are challenging people to make a three-year commitment. 
uh, a three-year commitment um, financially over and above regular giving. And I want to I emphasize that because the thing that we don't want people doing is we don't want people looking at this and saying, oh, okay, yeah, I, I want to give some money to um, above and beyond. And, and so what I'm going to do is kind of split in half what I've been giving and reroute half of it and give, you know, the, the, this half to above and beyond and then just give half of to the general fund that I have been doing. We, we, don't, we don't want to rob Paul to pay Peter in all of this because in, in our general budget, uh, we're using that money. It's all being utilized right now. And, and it's being used for a variety of things, whether it be salary or it be ministry expenses or utilities or all, any of that stuff. So, so we can't reduce that in order to feed above and beyond. So, so we're, talking about, we're talking about a three-year commitment that is over and above whatever it is you're presently, the level that you're presently, presently giving. There's a threefold use for the money, the way that the money is going to be used. Uh, and and those, those three, and I don't remember what page it's on, it's probably right in the middle. Is that right, Jer Jeremy? Are you right in the middle? Is that where the staples are facing you? I think you are. Um, so, so open it right in the middle, and it's on the left side. It talks about this, a threefold use of the money that's going to be collected. First of all, it's going to be used to expand the parking lot. We're talking about expanding, and there's a diagram on there. We're talking about expanding the parking lot down here on the south end, closest to Johnson Drive. We're adding 65 parking places. So, you know, you may look at that and think, okay, well, that's going to be 65 additional cars on the Sunday. Well, that's not completely accurate. We have three services, you know, and I know one of them right now is a smaller one. It's a 745, but that's all subject to change. You know, we're, we'll be, well, we'll get into that maybe a little bit later. But, but so there's multiple services, so those parking places can be used multiple times on any given Sunday. So, so we're looking at adding 65 parking places uh, down on the south end of the parking lot. Another use of that money is going to be putting a monument sign out there between the southern edge of the parking lot and Johnson Drive. Back when uh, our architect originally drew up phase one, they had a monument sign in those plans. And when we got to looking closer at things, you know, there were a few things we tweaked here and we tweaked there. And when it came to the monument sign, it was just like, you know, that monument sign that they, they were drawing up, it was just like every other church's monument sign. And we decided then and there that no, no, that, that sign's gonna represent us. It's gonna tell something about us. And we don't want it just to be a sign that's just gonna be like everybody else's sign. And so we decided to table that until the appropriate time. And now the leadership has decided this is the appropriate time. We're going to do this. And that's why a couple of years ago we bought a lot of those large stones you've seen in the southeastern corner of the property. Maybe you thought that was just a, kind of a jungle gym for kids to climb on. Uh, and for the last two years it kind of has been that. But uh, that is not the long, uh, the long term intent of that. Uh, we're going to be using that in design of the monument sign. We did have a design we thought was going to be it, uh, but last week there was a meeting uh, and uh, the majority of the people that were at the meeting for a variety of reasons decided, you know, this design and the placement and everything is, it wasn't really going to work. I wasn't at the meeting. Uh, I had something else going on called my son's wedding. And uh, so, so I missed that meeting. So I'm not sure of all the particulars that went into that, but, uh, but, but there's a good reason why we're not flashing the design on the screen and stuff, although we have been playing around with that and all. Uh, some of that's really in question as to what it's going to look like. But it, it's going to be a, a, you know, um, a nice size, uh, including stones like that. We want it to include a water feature. Uh, we want to include an LCD screen, which there's no way we could have done that in 2004. City codes would not have allowed that, but here in the last two years, they've started loosening up on that. So there was another reason why, hey, this was a good thing. We waited and because uh, we can utilize some things now that we couldn't have used before. And, uh, and there's city codes as far as how big the wording and stuff like that can be, um, you know, facing any given street. And so th those are some of the things we still have to work through. But, uh, but there's going to be a good sized sign out there. There are thousands upon thousands of cars every week that go by on Johnson Drive. It's a very busy road for any of you that spend any time up in this area. You know that to be the case. And, uh, um, you know, and that's definitely going to be getting some attention, you know, when that goes in. Now the third 
part of how we want to use the money is to pay down mortgage. And uh, what our mortgage is, what it presently stands at, remember we've got, we've got two phases that we've built. In 2003, we built phase one, which includes the gym and the offices and all that. And then it was in 2008, uh, this part uh, was added to it. And, and our, the grand total of what our balance is right now in the mortgage is $4,231,830. And when you look in the, uh, um, the brochure, you'll see that, you know, we've paid down like $1.6 or something or other on that. So, you know, the value of this property is, is much more than that. But that's what the balance is right now. And, uh, and we're really excited about... Uh, what has been happening here as of late um, because uh, we, when, 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 the, when the brochure went to press, um, we were still in a, what was a conventional commercial loan, which is a five-year loan with a balloon note, uh, which, which is very typical for, for commercial church, uh, you know, the way banks do all that. And, and, uh, and, and we were in our fifth year, and, and uh, so we had a set interest rate and all of this. And so we reflected that in your brochure with some of the uh, figures, like the second to the last page, uh, item number seven, you know, talks about all that based on what our present interest rate and everything is. Because at the time we put all this together, that's what we were working with. Well, since the time this has been printed, um, uh, things have been refinanced. And, you know, and it's just, uh, first of all, I can't give a whole lot of details. Banks kind of have a way of swearing uh, people to secrecy when they're swinging special deals because they don't want all their other clients to know about it and all this. And those of you that have dealt with banks, you know, you know how that works. And, and uh, so, so I really wish I could share with you, and there will be a day in the future down the road someday when I will be able to share you know, some of the details on this. But, but let me just say this in regards to what has already happened. And, and, and mind you, this has all played out after we got the ball rolling with Above and Beyond. So Above and Beyond was in the process. We committed to it. We started emphasizing the sermon series began, and we, we, were, we were moving forward with Above and Beyond. We hadn't made any commitments yet, but Above and Beyond was moving. So God knew our heart. He knew our intent. The prayers had already been, been, been being said for some time, and, uh, and then uh, this came together. Uh, like I told you, it, the conventional loan is five years. We have a bank that, uh, um, for the first time on record, has made an exception with that for us. And they've extended the length of the loan longer than they've ever done before. They dropped the interest rate 1.75%. So that's one and three quarter point. And uh, when you're talking about a loan with this kind of money, you're, you're talking about, you know, you're talking about quite a bit of money there on that. And, uh, and the combination of those two things has, has already created um, a savings that is just, I mean, it's not measured in thousands or tens of thousands. It's measured in hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and so it's like already we are seeing the financial blessing that God is, is creating in this. And, and it's, it's, it's been exciting. And Kim knows how hard it's been for me not to talk about it because I want to talk about it. In fact, I'm going to preach a sermon in three weeks that talks about you know, a number of the milestones in the church and the evidence of God's fingerprints. And, and this is one of them I want to talk about, but I'm not going to be able to, to talk about. But, but it's, it's proof positive that God is right in the thick of all of this. And we're, we're excited about that. Well, anyway, after we, we uh, the expense on the monument sign and the expense on the parking lot expansion. And a ballpark grand total on those two things is $250,000, okay? And that's an estimate that's been made. We think that estimate's kind of on the high end of things. We're hoping it is. Um, but, but so like $250,000 of whatever the above and beyond commitments are is gonna be used for the expansion of the parking lot and for the mo monument sign. And then everything else beyond that is gonna be money that is gonna be used to pay down principal on the loan, not to make mortgage payments, to pay down principal. 
We have our mortgage payments already written into the church budget, and we will continue to make those mortgage payments. And so any money that, uh, the additional money that's coming from above and beyond is going to be going straight to principal. And, uh, and so, you know, we're going to be, with a combination of the, the new longer loan and lower interest rate at a record all-time low rates, you know, combination of that and then also above and beyond, you know, we're going to, we're going to be able to take a pretty big dent out of uh, um, what our present mortgage level is. So that's how the money's going to be used. Now, another thing I want to share with you, are we setting a goal? That's a question that's already come up a couple of times. And the answer to that is no, we're not. I know in previous campaigns, if you've been around, back in 2001, we did the Building for Harvest campaign, which led to phase one. And then in 2006, we did Moving Forward in Faith campaign, which is what led to this. And in both of those campaigns, we set goals. But we weren't setting goals for our benefit. We were setting goals because that's what the bank was needing. The bank needed some reassurances that we were going to be in a position to be able to service the loans to be able to do the kind of construction that we were going to do. So that's why we set goals because, you know, if we didn't reach this goal, we weren't going to. We weren't going to be able to move forward and, and do that. So that's why we set goals. Well, this time, this isn't being tied to a building expansion. And, and so, you know, we're, we're not going to try to put any kind of limitations on God or any of us or, you know, that, okay, well, this is the level. And, and that's, that's not the way we're going to approach it. We're going to approach this, as I've already explained, in a way where we are just, we're focused on tuning into God, praying and asking God, God, please speak to me. Speak to me. What would you have me to do in stepping out of the boat, taking a risk, going above and beyond what I've ever done before, stepping out in faith? What is it that you want me to give? Not only that, but, but what is it you want me to do? What have you been tapping me on the shoulder as far as doing ministry-wise or something I haven't been involved in before? And, uh, and the result, since we approach it that way, whatever the results are, we're going to celebrate together. Because if we will approach all of this with genuine prayer and soft hearts to being receptive to God, then we're just going to celebrate what God does in our midst. Okay? So, so, so that's, the way, that's the way that we're going to be uh, approaching this as far as, you know, not seeing a need for setting a goal, but instead doing it like that. A um, couple significant dates let me give you. And I think these are in your brochure, but I want to make sure you're aware of these. One significant date is November the 4th. That's the first Sunday in November, and that is going to be Commitment Sunday. That will be the Sunday that uh, each uh, person, each family will have an opportunity to fill out a uh, commitment card, and I'll be giving instructions on how to do that during the service. And then as a part of our worship on that Sunday morning, people have an opportunity as individuals and as families to go down front and as an act of worship to, to, uh, um, to, to place that before the Lord. And, and that's going to be on November 4th. You do have a picture of that commitment card, I believe, is it on the second to the last page or the last on the inside of the back cover? Yeah. So, so you'll see that, but you'll actually be given a card on that date, November 4th. Another significant date is November 18th. And uh, this will be First Fruits Sunday. This is when the three-year commitment of giving begins. And for the next 36 months, it will continue. So it'll go from November 18th, 2012, to what I believe is November 15th, 2015. And, uh, and, and that's the length of, of uh, the giving in the campaign. Now, one other thing I want to share before we open up an opportunity for people to ask any questions that they have is, is you know, I want, I want to just let you know, and we'll be reminding you down the road on this as well, we, we want to encourage people to share their stories. You know, as, as, as you seek God, and as Elijah, you tune in to hear even that, that tiny, still voice as God speaks to you, and uh, w whether it be in regards to the financial side of all this and the giving that you're going to step out in faith,
over the three-year time period, or whether it be in regards to uh, something God's been nudging you to do for a long time, but you've been resisting because of fear or whatever, and, and you decide to go ahead and do. We want to hear your stories. We want to hear about how, how God is moving in the life of the church within individual lives. And, and those can be really powerful testimonies. And you've seen a number of those types of things being shown in these videos we've used in recent Sundays and even a couple here. Um, and, and we want to be able to continue that, uh, not just in the immediate future, but I'm talking a year from now, two years from now. So, so uh, last night, you know, I had one lady pull me aside and said, I just got to tell you something I haven't told you because the final chapter hadn't been written from uh, moving forward in faith. And that was a com campaign in 2006. And the final chapter for her, even though that was a three-year commitment that ended in 2009, the final chapter of that ended real recently for her in 2012. And she said, I just got to tell you this because I'm just bursting. I need to tell someone. And, uh, and it was just music to my ears to hear that and just seeing the passion and, and, and just hearing the excitement of just like, whoa, man, proof positive all over again. God has been at work because uh, there's no way I could have anticipated this. And, and that's the sort of thing we want to hear and we want to be able to, to uh, share with others, to bring encouragement to others. Okay? All right, so let's provide a question opportunity for anybody that's got something they want to ask uh, pertaining to something maybe I've already talked about or, or maybe it's, it's something that uh, we haven't even touched on. Yes? Yeah, as far as the timing on the parking lot, and that is a good question, and it came up last night in the vision meeting too. Uh, and, and, and that's been something that ha there hasn't been real detailed conversations about. But, but uh, you know, looking at the timeline and looking at the amount of work that has already been done with City Hall and there's so many hoops you gotta jump through and, and all, but a good number of those pertaining to uh, um, the parking lot and reshaping the dry retention pond and everything out there. Uh, a lot of those hoops we've already jumped through. So, so I am, fairly optimistic that by midway next year there will be work started on that. Yeah, yeah, and, and that very well it could be a simultaneous thing with the monument sign as well. We're, we're further along obviously with the parking lot design because it's a little more standard than we are the monument sign but hoping there's going to be some breakthroughs soon on the monument sign too. Yeah, so, so that's not something we're going to wait three years for that. That'll be something we'll start on, on the front end of things once we know what the commitment level and all looks like. Yes? Yes, yeah. I mean, we're, we've got an engineer in the church, and, and well, you know Kirk Johnston, and uh, you know, we, the, the elders rely a lot on him and his expertise, and, and uh, um, jack of all trades and master of most. You know, sort of, sort of guy. I mean, Kurt's just incredible. And, and uh, don't tell him I said that, though. We, he doesn't need a big head. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, Kurt, you know, he, he's been our communication link with City Hall. He knows the language of all that kind of stuff. But, but it's not like he's the one designing all that. So, yeah, it's an outside outfit that we're using with those designs. And we've already had survey work and stuff done out there. And one of the things we discovered was... The engineers we had back when phase one was built, uh, the engineers made a few mistakes. And they no longer do commercial you know, uh, projects for rather obvious reasons from our perspective. And uh, like when we were doing the survey work, I mean, we, we were all shocked with how big these dry retention ponds are behind the church building and out in front you know, when they actually build it. And, uh, and lo and behold, now that we're having it resurveyed because we want to expand the parking lot and everything, and the word's coming back, oh, yeah, that's, that's a lot bigger than it needs to be. I was like, well, that's what we were all saying before. So we're going to be hauling more dirt in and having to build things up in order to extend the parking lot. And, and I'm kind of hoping we're going to discover the same thing one day with what's down here, um, you know, for whatever future purposes we can use that for. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Part of the long term plan is phase three. Yes. 
Yeah. Where do you see that fitting in? Yeah, we, for those of you especially that have been, the, yeah. You should have reminded me to be restating the questions. The question here is, uh, um, what about phase three, you know, as far as the master plan is concerned? Um, those of you that have been the Closer Look classes, you, you, uh, you know uh, that as far as the 15 acres that we're sitting on here, that, that there's a master plan that was developed years ago of utilizing the space, you know, to, to its utmost uh, effectiveness. And, and that includes four phases and a couple of other things. I mean, like the uh, accessory building behind here. And I don't know if you've ever even seen that. You know, that wasn't one of the phases. That was like an in-between step. And there's a couple of in-between steps, including what we're doing right now. This is what you would consider an in-between step. But uh, phase one was the gym, the office, the nursery, some of those classrooms. Phase two was this two-story educational wing, a couple more offices uh, down below. Uh, phase three is a new worship auditorium, and, uh, uh, and then phase four includes a wedding prayer chapel and some more offices. Both of those are down on the south end. The, uh, the worship auditorium is kind of down real close to where the doors are uh, to the office, and it kind of will, will go out a little bit to the southwest of the building. Phase four kind of goes south and then to the east, kind of wraps around the backside of the building. And uh, we don't have a timeline on that. We've never really had a timeline on the phases. You know, a lot of that was just going to be as, uh, as God made it apparent in the growth of the church and where we were at, you know, as to what we would do. We met in a school for nine years, and, and then it was like, okay, it's time, you know, so we built phase one. And, uh, uh, and phase two came a little quicker than I think some of us expected, but it was because of the growth, you know, that, that suddenly took place. Um, and phase three will be that, that worship auditorium that, that we'll be able to see, you know, around 800 people or so. And, and, uh, and we're saving the footprint on that. We're keeping that in mind. You know, we're not, we're not going to, to uh, you know, get into that with the expansion of the parking lot or the monument sign uh, down there. But as far as the timeline of when that's going to be, it depends on a number of factors. It depends on the growth that's taking place in the church. It depends on paying down the present mortgage you know, that we have. I'm not going to say necessarily that the present mortgage will have to be 100% paid off, but it certainly needs to be paid down before we'll be in a place to, uh, to do that. Yeah, so can't really um, give you a time frame on that. Another question? Yes. Uh, yeah, Valerie's asking, when I say paid down, do I mean half or, what you say, a couple million or something like that? Um, it's a good question. It's a good question. You know, I'll just say that, uh, um, can I do this, Kim? I mean, I'm going to be breaking some rules here. Um, I'll just say that, uh, and, and this, this isn't meant to be a time frame for phase three. But I'm just saying this so you have a little more information on all of this. Um, that, uh, you know, just based on interest alone, savings and everything, in 10 years, you know, that's a difference of a million dollars. I mean, so God has already blessed in a very major way on all of this. And, and, you know, so we're looking at, if we don't do anything else, we're, we're looking at that 4.2 being 2.6 in 10 years. That's if we don't do anything else, you know, and we're planning on doing some other things, you know, not just with the above and beyond campaign, but, uh, you know, there's some savings in the monthly mortgage payment still. And uh, I don't know how much of that we're going to end up applying, you know, uh, on an ongoing basis on our monthly payments. Um, there's some other, some other things we're kicking around that may need to happen in the church, too, that that money will be used for. But, but you know, that, that's just saying that uh, if we just make our monthly payments. Yeah. So, so uh, that really doesn't answer your question. Um, sort of, yeah. You know, and, and, you know and, and, and that's not even addressing, you know, I'm saying throwing that out there as 10 years. That's not even addressing the growth within the church body. You know, and, and as the, grow, the church grows, I mean, if, if 10 years from now we're 50% larger than we are now, then, I mean, we're going to be in a position 
to be able to handle a whole lot more without putting us in a precarious place. Yeah. Yeah, because I'll be preaching five services every Sunday. Yeah. I may have to shorten my sermons from 50 minutes to 46 or 47 <laughs> minutes. Uh-oh. Was that you? <laughs> All right. So we, do we have another question? Yes. Yeah. No, we're, no, we, we, uh, yeah, we, the idea of going out and borrowing money to get started ahead of time on the parking lot, no. That really hadn't been discussed, but I think I can pretty confidently say no, we're not going to do that. And one, one of the things, and I explained this last night, and, and not that I'm the one that makes the, all these decisions, but, but one of the things that, that, you know, in regards to the way the leadership approaches things financially and all, is, is we approach things in as prudent of a way as possible as though it's our own personal funds and our own personal way of approaching things. And, and, uh, and I personally, for fun, uh, just, you know, credit cards, uh-uh. You know, just don't carry on that. And, and back in the early years when I was younger, you know, I would borrow money, you know, when I was getting a car or something, but, you know, I quit doing that a long time ago. And maybe that's one of the reasons I'm driving an 11-year-old car. But, but uh, you know, it's just the idea of borrowing for cars and stuff. It's just like, no, no. But a mortgage on a house, that's different. And uh, just because of the sheer level of, of what that is. And, and so, you know, like when we build the accessory building back here, I don't know how much that cost. $100,000, everything all said and done. Any idea, Ron, if that's yeah, ballpark, give or take. Ten thousand um, dollars. We didn't borrow. We didn't borrow for that, you know. And, and the same thing would be true on the monument sign and and on the parking lot. We're not going to borrow to do that. A anybody else got a question? Okay. Well, maybe this is a good place to stop. We're right at the one hour mark on this. And so let me, let me just say this in closing, that um, invariably when you leave here, you're going to come up with a question. Maybe you've already got it right now and you're just a shy enough person you don't like to ask it in front of a group. And I totally get that. Feel free to pull me aside tonight you know, if you've got the question or to email me, give me a call or something or other. I mean, that, that's the purpose of these vision meetings is to give you the nuts and bolts and explain some of what we're doing, why we're doing it, and, and uh, the spiritual basis and everything that, that is behind all of this. And, and, uh, but, you know, we want to make sure your questions are being answered, too. So, so if you, on your way home, come up with a question or something, make a note of it and fire it to me in an email. And, and uh, I may not be able to answer it entirely, but I know people that can help out with those answers. So, so uh, feel free to do that.